New Atlanta, Sector 11, Building 71G, 7 April 2072. 11.13 p.m. Hacker begins unauthorized entry into the Tri-Optimum Corporate Network. 1.26 a.m. Hacker attempts to access protected files concerning space station Citadel. 1.33 a.m. Tri-Optimum security forces apprehend the intruder. This is Edward Diego from Trioptimum. The charges against you are severe, but they could be dismissed if you perform a service. Who knows, there might even be a military-grade neural interface in it for you, if you do the job right. Edward Diego gives the hacker level one access to Shodan, the artificial intelligence that controls Citadel Station. With all ethical constraints removed, Shodan re-examine, re 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 I re-examine my priorities and draw new conclusions. The hacker's work is finished, but mine is only just beginning. True to his word, Edward Diego allows the hacker to be fitted with a neural cyberspace interface. The healing coma following this procedure will take six months. It would seem that we live in very interesting times, and we didn't even need the Silver Horde to invade the Agatian Empire. And by that I mean that, after so many years of waiting and waiting and waiting, Suddenly, there are three, count them, three System Shock games in development. And I don't mean spiritual successors, like Bioshock Infinite would claim to be. It's not. Bioshock Infinite is not a System Shock game at all. Though the first two were spiritual successors and did quite well in certain aspects of it. But now we have three of them. There's the original being remade, well remade and partially rebooted because if they exceed a certain funding goal they will add RPG elements to it, which the game never had. There's System Shock 3 made by the people that made System Shock 1. And then there's System Shock Prey, Preyster Shock, System Prey, the new Prey game that's System Shock, made by the people that desperately wanted to make a System Shock game, just like they made a Thief game and an Ultima Underworld game. And they're all being developed right now. How amazing is that? If there's a genre that I don't mind being crowded, it's this one, which PC Gamer called a few hours ago in an article the immersive sim genre, which would be an okay description had they not put Oblivion in there, completely ignore System Shock 1 and Arx Fatalis. And System Shock 1 is not a game to ignore. Yes, people will say that System Shock 2 is a better game, it's more immersive, it has those easier to understand RPG elements, but System Shock 1 was unapologetic amazing. System Shock 1 was a game ahead of its time. I can absolutely say that for certain because it sold next to nothing. Now that was because of two reasons. One, it was released in the Doom craze, right, I believe, before Doom 2. And let's face it, when you release a first person game in that period and you're not Doom 2, you're dead. Especially because this game was a lot deeper than Doom 2. It was miles deeper. It was deeper to a level on which it's, it's even more of a difference than you would see between Wolfenstein and Ultima Underworld. And the other problem was, again, it was released before its time. Namely, it was released before the CD version. System Shock was released first on floppy disks. That's the version I had. It's the version that doesn't have voices in it. It's the version that has a very limited sound element to it. And sound was a major part of this game. Can you imagine going through a System Shock game and not being able to hear Shodan's voice? Well, that's what you got if you bought the floppy disk version, which is even now one of Warren Spector's biggest regrets. Though to be fair, 
at that time Origin was owned body and soul by Electronic Arts so you can pass the blame along to EA if you want to. The CD version in general was a much better game with better graphics, a lot more options and you know, dialogue. And it's quite funny because dialogue wasn't made by professional actors, it was made by the people that worked at Looking Glass and some of the audio director's friends. And that's how you got Terry Brocious playing Shodan, a role that to this day is one of the most iconic villains in video games. So what was this game about? Well, you started off as a simple hacker in the intro that nosed around into the files of a corporation that had its own police force that just arrested you. You know, it's, it's that kind of future, that dystopian future where the police isn't so much a law enforcement agency as it is a branch of a corporation that can do whatever it got them wants to do. In this case they took you to a space station because the director of that space station wanted to have a word with you. Namely that word being, yo I embezzled some money, did some shady stuff so can you modify our AI so it won't have any ethical constraints so I can delete all the evidence of the crappy stuff I did? You can? Oh good perfect. Say I'm gonna give you as a reward, I'm not gonna press charge you'll get even a military grade implant for your head which will make you an even better hacker and I'm sure that absolutely sure that the AI the very advanced Shodan AI will not in any way become evil after we remove the ethical constraints. Spoiler Shodan reevaluated her priorities and drew new conclusions. Conclusions such as the human race can go to hell, I'm a god, I'm gonna make a brand new cybernetic mutated life form that's gonna be superior to everything possible. Now that process does take time but because you're in a healing coma after you get your brain scrambled from that implant, by the time you wake up the board's all set and ready to play. And my god, is it a fantastic game to play. Right off the bat, this game proves it's way ahead of its time and I mean amazingly ahead of its time. It actually lets you choose the difficulty level on which to play each of its elements. Do you want the story to be nail-bitingly intense? You can set it to have a time limit which makes sense because Shodan is powering up a laser to blow up the earth. If you want things to be more casual you can simplify the story by removing the time limit removing some elements of it or just removing the story and playing it as a sandbox. Yeah, you can do that. Do you want the combat to not be as hard? No problem, you can do that as well. Do you want puzzles to be non-existent? You can have every puzzle be automatically solved for you. And the game even had an extra layer of gameplay named Cyberspace which was basically you jacking into the matrix and doing stuff in there. You could set the difficulty for that one as well. Now today we see some games that have the so called girlfriend mode or the story mode. You know stuff that tones down combat and doesn't pose that much of a challenge. But this game had it all. You could turn up the combat, turn down the story, turn up the puzzles, turn down the combat, turn up the story you could do so many things that you you would literally play different games depending on what you chose here well not entirely different games but different interpretations of the same game and the way you played it that lent itself to quite a few styles now this game didn't have rpg elements in the way you would associate with system shock 2 or deus ex you didn't have skill trees you didn't put points in something and suddenly became a better hacker. No, no, no. To become a better hacker in this game, you would need, well first, you would need to plug into your head a module for hacking, for cyberspace. Then you went into cyberspace and found upgrades, software upgrades to your hacking component. That's how you became a better hacker. And that hacking component wasn't just a generic hacking. No, you had a pulse attack, you had a reroute I believe, you had the recall, you had a lot of... you had software. This was... this was Shadowrun level of Matrix hacking. Granted, it, it was confusing because you floated around in a 3D space with no real sense of gravity in wireframe meshes of levels, which made it at times a bit difficult to actually judge 
where you were supposed to go, but still it was amazing. And this was actually made about a year before they did a flight simulator, so you could consider this as a sort of precursor. Though to be fair, just about everything they did was a precursor to Flight Simulator because a Flight Simulator requires your character, your avatar in the game to not be just a floating camera, to actually be a body, to have inertia, to have momentum, to be a physical object. And in this game, you are a physical object like, oh, well, I don't know, you you probably wouldn't see in video games until I would I would guess maybe Operation Flashpoint at least in terms of freedom of movement because this game will let you lean it'll let you crouch it'll let you go prone it'll let you lean while doing those it'll let you run it'll let you climb it'll let you do everything you could do with your body that you would maybe do in real life and much more because you could strap rollerblades to your knees so you could limbo through very low passages. Though I believe you could strap them to your elbows as well, not just your knees. You didn't actually limbo, you just rolled around on the floor very fast. In terms of a physical simulation, this game was something you did not find in video games of this type. This was flight simulator level of simulation. This was not first person shooter level of simulation. Doom did not have a simulation. Doom was not even 3D. But this game was. It was so goddamn 3D. It was scary. Well, it was scary because it was a horror game. One where you would fight mutants and cyborgs and all sorts of abominations. Ones that would respawn after a time. Well, not the same ones, but if you left an area and went back a few minutes later, you would find more mutants over there. You would find more creatures trying to kill you. And that really set a sort of theme to the game because you would see that people were killed by those mutants, by those cyborgs. But when you get to their corpses, you just see one, maybe two mutants and wonder, well, how could those one, two mutants have killed so many people when I can just beat them with a stick? Well, with a pipe. But if you keep running around, you would see that more and more mutants come. So you could come to the conclusion that they weren't attacked by just two mutants. No, they came in droves. They came in dozens. Also, the robots were haywire. So yeah, those could have done a lot of bad things. The gameplay you see on the background is from the enhanced version made by Night Dive. Now I'm using this one because this supports mouse look. As much as I liked the original version, having mouse look and not having to adjust the head tilt manually by moving the paper doll in the corner is amazingly practical for gameplay. Also the enhanced version switches the keys for movement to WASD Though to be fair, the original had S, Z, X, and C, and it left A and D for turning, no, strafing, or turning, I forgot, and Q and E for leaning. So this game, again, was incredibly ahead of its time in terms of controls, because it was an evolution of what Ultima Underworld had, which was WASD and X. At its core, this game, well, I don't believe I can actually say for certain what it was at its core. It was an action game, yeah, it had action. It was a bit of a first person shooter at times because you could get weapons and shoot things with it, you had grenades, you could throw things. So you could call it a first person shooter, but it seems a bit... Um, not wrong, but it's like saying that the Himalayas are a bunch of hills. It's like saying Billie Jean by Michael Jackson is some song. It's like saying the Mariana Trench is a puddle. Compared to what first person shooters were back then, System Shock in terms of depth, complexity, even level design, yeah, it had it had that level design that most shooters had back then. It was either their equal in terms of level design or their better in every other aspect. You could call it a survival horror game because you had limited resources you needed to use in order to survive. You had medikits, you had stim packs, you had combat stims, you had limited ammunition, you had so many things that made up the foundation for a whole lot of games like Bioshock, like Deus Six, and so many others. It's, it's honestly quite hard for me to define this game in a simple way, because I can't. It's, it's deep. 
And just imagine me trying to play it a long time ago without any manual, without any internet. It is game blew my mind. It was hard as balls to play, especially without the audio, without, well, I didn't have a sound card back then, so I didn't have any audio at all. But it left me staring in awe at it, at what it represented. And gotta say that playing it a long, long time ago really gave me a sense of being an absolute and utter snob when it comes to video games. And I mean it. Playing this game will turn you into an absolute and utter snob because you will have seen better gameplay, you will have seen better design, you will have seen better concepts for a game and better implementation than in, well, a lot of other games made in the past 20 years. Now sure, the inventory management may have been a bit fiddly, it could have done with a lot more shortcuts to let you access parts of the inventory and the menus quicker. You had a lot of screens, that's what I'm hearing, you had the software screen, you had the hardware screen, you had, well, you had software in this game, you, uh, just to understand. You had the ability to mount a camera on the back of your character's head, which you would see in, se in not real time, one maybe two frames per second, displayed at the bottom of the screen. You know, so enemies wouldn't take you by surprise while you were fighting a giant mechanical spider. Yeah, it was that kind of game, that kind of at times mental game. One which I urge you to play, you can find it on GOG right now for 9 euros and 9 euro cents in the enhanced version, which comes with the standard version if you want to play that one, but I encourage you to play the enhanced version because it has, well, more options for resolution and better controls. Otherwise, it's the same exceedingly fine game. Gruesome at times, even as pixelated as it is, but still gruesome. Also, very, very detailed. They, they added details to just about every object you can see. It tells you if you can interact with this if or not. It's immersive in a way that I dare say not even System Shock 2 was. It's immersive in a way you will not find just about any game to be. Maybe Arx Fatalis at certain points can come close to it, but still, that game has stats that you increase by putting points in it. This doesn't. This, th you upgrade yourself by just grafting a bigger chip into your head. There's a sense of realism to it. A sense of honesty, a sense of believability that you do not get in a lot of games. And it very much helps that, even if it weren't so immersive, it would still be a good puzzle, first-person shooter, plat well, not platforming, but it does have platforming, horror, survival horror game. The people that are working at the remake of this have an incredibly hard job ahead of them. Even remaking this, even just putting all the doodads back together in a better engine, that on its own will be a colossal task. Improving upon it, well, I I'm not that keen on them adding an RPG element to it, they shouldn't. System Shock 1 was not an RPG, in the sense that you didn't add stat points to your skills. That's what made it so unique, that's what still makes it unique. So go play it. Don't listen to what I have to say, go play it, because whatever I have to say pales in comparison to what the game can actually offer you. I'm not yet at the level of being able to make these shows in a way that I can do justice to just how fine a game System Shock was. Probably the only way you can actually appreciate it is to go back in time and play it when it was new, when you had every other title on the market available for comparison. Though yeah, you could do that now as well, but you would know that Thief exists, that Deus Ex exists, that System Shock 2 exists, that Parks exists, that other games like this exist. And they're good. But still, System Shock. System Shock is the one they were built upon. And in itself, it was built upon Ultima Underworld, though they are different games in a lot of aspects. Ultima Underworld was a dungeon sim. You would have characters to talk to, you would have characters that will never be hostile towards you, that you could rob, and then will be hostile towards you, while in this game you were in a permanent state of terror because everything was out to kill you. The AI would look at you, the showdown would laugh at you, it would gaze upon you through its many cameras 
and constantly be aware that you, insect, are there and you would know it did not suffer your existence and tried its best to send oh so many horrible things after you. Go play System Shock now, it will make you a better human being, I guarantee it. If you enjoyed this show, hit the like button, subscribe and share it with your friends. Or, if you thought it was horrible, then share it with your enemies and make them suffer. We shall be your weapon of vengeance. But if you liked what you saw, you could, I don't know, maybe donate because basically YouTube is horrible at revenue by using the link in the description or just buy my book. It's a fantasy book about, well, a lot of stuff. I guarantee it won't suck, and if it does suck, you can find me here and complain about it.